Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all today. Everyone's smiling. Well, most everyone's smiling. It's still good to see you. Uh, we're glad that you're here with us in God's house this morning. Also, those who are at home and uh, watching online, we're glad that you're here with us as well. And uh, trust that all of us, whether here or there, uh, will be able to engage in the worship of God because it's Him that we're here to see. And He's here with us this morning, right? Praise God. I love that. And so let's uh, focus our thoughts and attentions on Him today. Uh, I do want to share just a couple quick announcements as we get started. Uh, things that are going on, there's a lot more in the bulletin. I'm going to trust you to read it, but these are just things that are happening really quickly here today. Uh, first of all, after the service this morning, we're uh, doing our harvesting workshop. Uh, it'll, we're serving lunch, we're having lunch provided downstairs, and so like 11.30 we want to be uh, down there, so make your plans for that. I'll do my best to be done preaching by then. Also, also today, today's a busy day. The uh, community choir is doing their concert here at 3 o'clock, and I encourage you, I, those, those who are participating in the choir, just stand up for a second, would you? I, where are they at? Well, they're sleeping in. No, they're not. There they are. Good job. We're proud of you, and we'll keep praying that uh, uh, this will be a real blessing. So come on out and join us. They'll be here. You should be here, too. So 3 o'clock. Community Choir will be meeting. Uh, coming up on Tuesday, uh, Red Cross Blood Drive will be, we're hosting a Red Cross Blood Drive here from 1 to 6. Uh, I encourage you, if you haven't yet, to, uh, to register, make an appointment uh, to, to give blood. It's an opportunity for us to be involved in our community. Our area blood needs are, are high and the supplies are low, and so you know what that means. Uh, we need everyone on, on deck with that. So that's Tuesday, 1 to 6. One last thing that I need to tell you about. Uh, we had talked about baptism service earlier in May, and things happened that got in the way with, uh, with us doing that, but we're back on track. So we've scheduled a baptism service for June 19th which is Father's Day, by the way, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so it'll be a part of our morning service. I uh, encourage you to be praying about that. And if you uh, have been thinking about being baptized, come and talk to me or one of the elders. We'll be glad to, to fill you in on that. But you need to do it soon so we're able to get that all planned. Got the idea? All right. I told you there's a lot of other things in the bulletin. I'm not going to mention them because you are all intelligent people who read the bulletin every week, right? Yeah. Right. Good. And so uh, be up to speed on all that's going on there. One last announcement, and Mike is ready to make it. And it has something to do with something that is in your bulletin that looks like this. So remember back in March, we took a survey. And I said uh, in April, okay, in about a month, we'll be able to get the results back to you. And then... Um, uh, from the district office, uh, Dave Murphy, he got COVID, and so we had to reschedule our meeting, and it took another month. So <laughs> anyway, here we are. So these are the results, and um, you can s uh, just to overall um, give us a, an understanding that, that the, the bands, um, if, if we had scored below two, that would be like no development. We haven't done anything in that area of those nine areas. And then yellow is that, that that's low development and green is the moderate development and then the blue is very strong development. And so overall we're in the moderate development area. Um, the nine categories are spiritual leadership, that's the, the, the leaders are um, spiritually, biblically, uh, qualified and are helping others to become that. And uh, the personal growth is how we each individually are growing in, in the Lord. Um, missions focus is not just global missions, but it's also missions to our community and the region and our involvement in that. Uh, loving community is pretty self-explanatory. The worship gathering is what we're doing here this morning. Um, vision alignment is how the programs and, and ministries that we have here at the church are aligned to 
the mission of, of what Jesus has called us to do. Um, Alliance partnership is how well we work, um, how much we are involved with the Alliance, and financial stewardship is self-explanatory, and effective organization is just that we're organized in a way that we're able to effectively accomplish what, what we're doing here. So we're, we'll have um, meetings with the Northeast District, the elders and the admin board over the next few months and looking at these in more detail. We just did a summary meeting just to go over the results in general. Um, last week? Two weeks ago. <laughs> and uh, so we'll have more about that as we prepare to expect the advancement of the kingdom here in our community. Thanks. Would you please stand with me now? And we're going to talk to our God together. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for the privilege you give to us to gather in your house today. And that you're here with us, Lord is a blessing beyond words. We are honored. And we ask, Lord God, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts would be honoring to you as well as we gather today. By your spirit, work in us and through us to accomplish just that. And we will give you the glory and the praise always. As we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son and our Savior, blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. You want to worship a little? All right, let's do that.
the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. Circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. all authority, declaring blessings, every promise he is faithful to keep. I speak the name no great could ever hold. He is greater, he is stronger, he's the God of us. That was a really powerful song, in Jesus' name. Thank you, worship team, for help in settling our spirits as we begin to focus on God's faithfulness and his greatness. Today I have the great honor and opportunity of bringing you this week's worship prayer. But before, I would like to briefly talk about what God has been placing on my heart. As our economy seems to be continuing to impact our lives in a negative way, I often think, slide one, this thought comes to my mind, a day late and a dollar short. I logically know and believe we are living in the last portion of the last days, but I'm I'm amazed that I feel so woefully unprepared for what keeps happening. I keep hearing my mind say, 
I should have saved more. I need cheaper gas. I should have prepared for power outages. I should have long-term food storage. I should have replaced my roof. I should have upgraded my vehicle before the prices went up. I don't have enough money. Slide two, please. Isaiah 26, three. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. So being somewhat prepared for what we think the future might bring us, it's a very good thing. Jesus talked about the parable of the ten virgins and how they had oil for their lamps. Five of them had extra oil. Five of them didn't. But what I think we need to do is learn to put our trust and hope in God alone. And as we learn to believe that God will care for us. A couple weeks ago in the men's Bible study, we discussed the beauty of, the next slide please. Listen much and say little. Something I struggle with. Um, yes, it sometimes works with people. But it's very necessary during our meditation time with God. Two weeks ago, a few of us attended a Holy Spirit weekend. It was led by Rob Reamer, an Alliance pastor. He is the writer of the book Soul Care, we used in our small groups last year. And it was fantastic, but I'm always surprised that I know so little and can continuously learn and be greatly challenged over and over again. At the conference, we each had an amazing opportunity. We broke into small groups, no less with people we had never met, to develop our skills in prophesying to each other or hearing the Holy Spirit's voice. Again, like in our men's group, we were told to empty our mind of everything. We're supposed to attend to God's presence. We're supposed to be still. We need to be at a place of peace and rest. That's what Jesus did. This is one of the places where God will speak to us. Next slide, please. Might be a little bit hard to tell, but um, there's a picture there. It's a canoe. I was given a few words from my group, but the very first word a, per a person gave me, it immediately brought to my mind, this could only be from God alone. The word given to me was broken canoe. Well, this word obviously grabbed my attention because I had just recently ran over my canoe in my truck. Remember, I've never seen this person, I've never spoken to this person. Sheepishly and expectantly, each of us gave a word of knowledge to each participant in our group, and it challenged us. So, I'm going to challenge you guys. I want to encourage some of you that you too can hear the Spirit's voice, but we must first stop to listen and clear the clutter of the world from our hearts and our minds. I want to encourage some of you that 
you can bring the peace of Jesus into a chaotic room or situation you encounter. Next slide, please. So this week I asked the Lord for a word for the church. I'm asking each of you to test this word for yourself, and if you accept it, please live in it. The word is, the time is now, and this time is yours. So this is what my interpretation of what the word means for me. Many, many, many in this world are ripe for harvest. Is COVID, political differences, all the loss we're seeing, the turmoil. I think both the believers and the unbelievers are looking upward. They're looking for something. I believe the word for those of us that have been waiting for the Holy Spirit to move on our family members and the people we've been praying for for years and even our neighbors. So this is the time to bring unbelievers into the kingdom. As you and others have been preparing the soil, God has watered and ripened the fruit, and harvest time is coming, so we must be ready to do our part. So I want to challenge you guys this week. Um, and I request that you would read Hebrews chapters 10 and 11, and then all of Colossians. Um, sounds like a lot, but it's not. It should take you less than a half an hour to encourage and refresh your faith and understanding of Jesus' forgiveness to us by dying once and for all for us. Um, so at this time, I'd like to go to prayer. Lord, you are good, and you have been so good to me. Lord, I thank you for this church and giving us freedom to meet here with like-minded people. Lord, I believe... You can fix my broken canoe, and I need your help to continue in my race, and I admit I can't do it on my own. Forgive us of our unbelief as we further our faith, our confidence, and trust in Jesus. Forgive us of our sins against you and against others. I pray against the division in our country. I ask you to reveal lies and deceptions and bring truth out into the open in all levels of our government. Lord, please bring peace back to our nation and raise up a new righteous leader who's willing to serve others at all levels, Lord even in our school systems. I pray against divisions in your holy church as a whole. And I pray healing in our church here today. Lord, quiet us even here today to hear what you have for each of us. Lord, bless Pastor Dave's message on Pentecost. Lord, I am thankful you're still our healer. And a big praise, I'm thankful for Jeff Pass that he's able to start up work, Lord, this week. And please provide him special endurance and strength. I also pray for strength for AJ as he resumes his fight against cancer. And for those fighting COVID again, there's so many, Lord, I can't keep up with, but please help each to heal back to full health again.
Lord, be with the Schweitzer family and Jen, especially, Lord, this week. Provide them with a piece of Jesus and maybe even opportunities to minister to their families. Lord, I thank you for our missionaries, and I ask you to please protect them, to bless them and prosper each of them as they minister throughout the world. And Lord, I think of the Christians throughout the world that are in hard places, like Ukraine, Russia, China, the Middle East and Africa. Just protect and bless them also, Lord. And Lord, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, your holy city. Lord, I pray all these things expectantly and in your holy son's name, Jesus. Amen. For the reading this morning, I'd like each of you to participate. That is, take a pew Bible. I'm going to be reading from that translation. And um, you can catch me on all the words that I mispronounce and misread or don't read. We're going to be reading from three portions of scripture. And um, I'll take them one by one. We can find them. First one's in Leviticus 23, 16 and 15 and 16, and to help you find your way there, it's on page 120. We've only got two verses here. Well, I'm wrong, all right. Yeah, there we are, 120. Verses 15 and 16 of chapter 23. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count off seven full weeks. Count off 50 days up to the day after the seventh Sabbath, and then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. Okay, we're going to flip over to another one in Numbers the very next book, in chapter 28, uh, let's see, page uh, 160, uh, 28, nope, page 161. These numbers get smaller every year. <laughs> okay, starting from the 16th, uh, the 26th verse to the 31st. On the day of first fruits, when you present to the Lord an offering of new grain during the Feast of Weeks, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Present a burnt offering of two young bulls, one ram, and seven male lambs, a year old, as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. With each bull there is to be a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, with the ram, two-tenths, and with each of the seven lambs, one-tenth. Include one male goat to make an atonement for you. Prepare these together with their drink offering in addition to the regular burnt offering and its grain offering, be sure the animals are without defect. Okay, now we're flipping over to the third section, and that's in Acts. Okay, Acts, the first chapter, and that's over... 1077, and we'll read the first through the eighth verses. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach 
until the day he was taken up to heaven and giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, and that gift is which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time ready to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. God bless his reading. Thank you, Duane. And now all of you at least know the page numbers we're going to be referring to as we go through, right? Uh, if there's any kids who have not headed down for Children's Church, they can head on out now uh, and enjoy that time in God's Word together as we enjoy our time in God's Word together this morning. Uh, as you have noticed by things we sang and things that were said and things that are on the screen, Today is Pentecost Sunday, and uh, for Jesus followers, that is the day that commemorates the gift of the Holy Spirit given to the church. Oh, someone should shout praise the Lord. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? What a gift God has given to us. But it began, the day of Pentecost wasn't new in the book of Acts. That wasn't something that happened then. It was, it was already there. It began in the Old Testament worship of the Jews as a celebration given to them by God. And so I think it's important that we not ignore the roots of the celebration. You know, it's like going back to understanding why we do what we do. In them we see a depth that enhances and fortifies what has grown from it, the church. And so I want us to spend some time, actually we're going to be talking about Pentecost this week and next week, because it's just lots to talk about. And uh, so we're going to begin at the beginning. So what was the Jewish celebration of Pentecost all about? As we recognize Pentecost Sunday today, I, think, I want us to get a strong grip on what, was really, what it was all, all about in the Old Covenant. Because although we live in the New Covenant through Christ, it has its foundations in the Old Covenant of God with His people, right? So we need to go back and understand that just a little bit. And get a grip on what it's really all about in the Old Covenant that God made with His people. And as I said, next Sunday, we're going to focus on what it means to us today as we live in the new covenant reality of Christ and his spirit dwelling in us. So Dwayne read and you read along with him uh, from Leviticus and Numbers how God instituted the celebration of Pentecost for his people. It was a festival prescribed in the law that occurred 50 days after Passover, thus Penta, you know, five, that's Pentecost, 50 days after Passover. And it was basically a harvest celebration. A closing celebration after 49 days of working in the harvest field. Here's an overview of what, or here's an overview of what was supposed to happen during that Pentecost celebration. There was a, there, it was all about, they knew it was coming, because it was one of those things that was, hey, this is after Passover, this is the next thing. 
And so they counted the days and the weeks waiting for the prescribed time. So we get this idea of anticipation. They were looking forward to what was coming. The celebration of the harvest. But while they waited, it's important to note that they worked. Because harvest, the, the, the harvest does not come in all by itself, right? It, it just doesn't work that way. They gathered in the harvest. And if you've ever done that, you know what work is. There's something about being out in the field in the sunny weather and it's hot and, it, and you're bringing in the hay. What I, my experience is bringing in hay. And it's like, man, that is work. And when you're done with that day, you know you worked. And so that anticipation of what was coming was in the midst of the work that they were doing. But then the day arrived, and they celebrated their work, bringing in the harvest, by stopping their work. Isn't that fun? They, they celebrated their work by stopping. That's just always kind of made, made me look twice at it. They had gathered in the harvest, and they were done with it now. They, and they gathered together. After they stopped their work, they gathered together in a solemn assembly to worship God with sacrifice, the first fruits of their labor. Why would they worship God for the harvest? Because they realized He's the source of it. He's the one that sends the rain and the sun. He's the one that causes the seeds to grow. He's the one. It's all about God. And so they worshiped. Pentecost was a day to remind them where, actually from whom, their harvest had come. Everything that they offered on Pentecost had come from God's bounty. As we are reminded in Job that it is He, God, who gives rain to the earth and sends water to the fields. Yeah, they worked the fields. They knew that. Their muscles were probably still a little sore from the work of the harvest. But they understood that work was part of God's gift to them, to mankind, as a reminder of how much we're like Him. Because isn't that how God began everything? He worked in creation, creating it all. They knew that God was the source of the harvest. Paul and James reminds us of that when they were writing to the church. In, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul wrote, So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God gives us the growth. James wrote it to the church this way, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. You see, we share this same reason to worship God as they did in the Old Covenant. You understand that, right? We worship because it is God who provides us with everything that we have. Their worship was great because they worshipped with the gifts that God had given to them. In Deuteronomy, as they were, as the, they were describing the Feast of Pentecost, said, you know, you're to celebrate the Festival of Weeks, which was what that was called also, you're to celebrate the festival of weeks to the Lord your God with a free will offering that you give into purport, in proportion to how the Lord your God has blessed you. Everything that we give is His. There's an old hymn, and I always liked it. We give thee but thine own, dear Lord, whate'er the gift may be. Because it's come from Him to begin with. Everything. Everything. So they anticipate, they work, they stop their working and worship. And finally they were to remember. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. They rejoiced before the Lord their God, right? The, the place where he chooses to have his name dwell. Realizing that 
If God is with you, there's every reason to rejoice because you remember where he's brought you from. For the Jewish people, they were slaves in Egypt and they needed to remember it has not always been this way. I'm not who I was, praise the Lord. We also share that with this old, te old covenant. We are to remember where God has brought us from. I'm not who I was. Praise the Lord. But it's important to remember. For me, it is a time to say, I don't ever want to go back there again. I don't ever want to go back there again. Over time, the Jews also linked Pentecost with the giving of the law. They kind of, I don't know how they figured it out, but they thought, well, that's probably about the same time of year that Moses went up on the mountain and received the law from the, the, the covenant from God. So the Old Testament Pentecost became an annual celebration, not only of the harvest, but of the new covenant, the first covenant of, excuse me, the first covenant of God from Mount Sinai. So that gives you an idea of the, what the what Pentecost was in the old covenant. And next week we're going to touch on that a little more as we see what Pentecost became to the church in the book of Acts. It wasn't an annual celebration, that it was and is an annual celebration of the giving of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. So you can start anticipating right now. Only a week, not 50 days. Just be waiting. Next week we're going to come back to that. But I want us, as we talk about the Old Covenant and what we see about that, I want us to say, well, what does that matter to me? Understanding is, is important, but how does it make a difference in my life? One thing that you need to remember about God is that he never does anything by chance. You know that, right? Wrap your head around this. God never does anything by chance. He has a plan. And he has always had a plan. A plan right from the very beginning. And everything that he does fits into that plan just the way he wants it to fit in. Everything he does fits into that plan to create for himself a people made in his image, according to his likeness. That's always been the goal. And it hasn't changed, has it? Even for you and I, his goal is that we would become what? More and more like Jesus. What is that? Being made in his image, in his likeness. That's God's plan. Hasn't changed. So the celebration of Pentecost described for Israel in the Old Testament was, was made the way it was for a reason. God had a reason for them to follow these steps in this celebration. It points us to how God intends to bring his plan to fruition even today in you and me. As we recognize Pentecost Sunday today, let's get a strong grip on what it's really all about. Next Sunday, we'll focus on what it means for us to live out that in our lives, yes. But today, let the depth of the new covenant of Jesus capture your mind and your heart. When Jesus asked his disciples at the Lord's Supper to remember him, we'll get to that in a little bit this morning too. When he asked them to remember him at the Last Supper, it wasn't, it wasn't like they were supposed to like scroll through their Facebook memories. Oh, yeah, remember that day? Oh, that was fun. What was he? Who was that person? No, Jesus wants us to meditate on the depth of who he is and who he forever will be. We need to remember him. And that begins with who he was from the beginning. So our understanding of Pentecost from the start colors and enhances our view of God today.
Like the Old Testament Jews, we need to remember these instructions. We wait in anticipation for the fruition of what God has begun. Too many times we spend our life like this, walking down the path, and all we see is the path, right? We spend way too much time, I spend way too much time doing that. What we need to be doing is looking where we're going, looking for what God is accomplishing in our lives, where He's leading us to. That's the anticipation. This world is not my home. Amen. Although it seems to be. When that trumpet sounds, I'm out of here. Woo. Anticipation of the fruition of what God has begun. When he's planted a seed of faith in you. And any time a seed is planted, it is with anticipation of harvest. It's anticipation of fruit. He has planted this faith in you not just so that you can have eternal life someday way out there. He's planted a seed of faith in you so that you will be able to live it today and tomorrow and the next day. Each day growing and growing and growing. He's planted that seed of faith in us. And we wait for the harvest of righteousness that He intends in our lives. But you know, waiting isn't doing nothing. Right? Just like the, the, in the Old Covenant Pentecost, they worked. They worked. Our waiting is occupied by the work that God has assigned us to do. Faithful obedience is what tends the seed of faith that He has planted in our lives. Faithful obedience is what tends the garden. Weeding by His Word. As we see, oh, yes, do that. Oh, don't do that. Tilling in trust. Lord, do you want me to tear this up? Okay, here we go. I'm not sure how that's going to work. Prayerfully pruning. Spending time. As Tom mentioned this morning, listening to God. All those things included in that idea of submitting to the guidance and the provision of, of the Holy Spirit of God in us. That's the work that we're doing. We don't just sit back and say, okay, God, change me. I mean, we do. We say, God, change me. And He's the one that makes the changes. We're not changing ourselves, but we're putting ourselves in that position for Him to do the work. We're reading His Word. We're spending time in prayer. We're listening to where He's leading us. But wait, Pastor, you said that at Pentecost, they were told to stop working. Which is it? Well, it's both. <laughs> Sabbath, which is what we, the Jews talked about as, as that holy day where they, every, every week where they ceased their working, reminds us how we're supposed to work. Because our rest, our ceasing of labor, represents that we're going to trust His provision. I don't, I don't work today. God's going to take care of me. You can see how in the Old Covenant that, and in the agrarian society that they lived in, that was a big deal. It was a big deal for them to say, I'm not going to go out and work in the field today. Everybody else who, uh, who lived around them, the nations that lived around them, looked at the Jews and said, what? You're wasting this perfectly good day. To do what? Go and sing and worship and pray? and uh, wh What? 
If you don't, they were like, if you're not doing the work, you're not going to get the harvest. What was the, what was the Jews' answer to that? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. My obedience to him is premier. That's what's most important. I trust him. I trust him. I trust him to make my fields grow. And you and I need to learn to trust him to grow in us that Christ-like character. So the Sabbath rest, the stopping of working represents that we trust his provision. We're able to stop working because God never stops working. He is at work in us. The spiritual harvest is his work, not ours. It all depends on him. But still at the same time, God invites us to join in his work with him. So yes, it's kind of both. We work, but we have to come to that point where we say, no, this is, not what, I, this is what you do, God, not what I do. I don't have to change myself because I can't change myself. I can't bring new life into me. That's his work, not mine. I can make all these resolutions and I can plan on doing this, that, and the other thing. And there may be good things even. But that's not, it's not the same as what he wants to do, the new life that he wants to bring in us. That's why each week we gather in solemn assembly, as they did, to worship God, to rejoice in his bountiful blessings, to be reminded we are his, he is ours. And to remember, remember who it is that has redeemed us, who it is that has given us this life, who it is who loves and cares for us as he does. This is a solemn assembly. Please don't take gathering as the church of Christ lightly, just something that we do every Sunday morning because that's what we always do. This is a time for us, this holy prayer. There's a holy purpose to worship God. He alone is worthy of all of your adoration and praise. There's no one else deserving of it more. Worship is all about Him, not you. This time that we gather together each week is about Him, not you. Worship is in your heart. And it is expressed in the things that you say and the things that you do every day. But especially as we gather together to worship God each week. It has absolutely nothing to do with what song we're singing or what scripture we're reading or whether the pastor said things right the whole time or not. Worship comes from the rejoicing that's in our hearts. We express it all those ways, but worship comes from the rejoicing that's in our heart, and the rejoicing is because we serve a great God. He's wonderful. He's been so good to me. That's where worship comes from. Your rejoicing is all about your new life in Christ. Don't take for granted how amazing it is that you were once dead in sin and now are alive in Christ. Praise the Lord. And I just want to say here this morning, you know, Jesus offers that forgiveness 
and life to you all the time. Maybe you're here and you've never made that choice in your life, the decision to confess your sins and to ask God to forgive you and to come and take over your life. That you want to be a Jesus follower. If you've never made that choice, there's no better time than right now to recognize He is the giver of life and I need Him. It is as uncomplicated as making that choice and saying to God, Lord, I admit I was born in sin. I've confirmed it in my life over and over again. Please forgive me. I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to follow you. And his promise is that when you come to him with a repentant heart, he always receives you. That's his promise. You don't have to fix yourself up ahead of time, get all gussied up, so you look good to him. You look beautiful to him always. What he wants is your heart. Faithful obedience. The only thing I ask of you, if, you if, you're, if you're listening to this here, you're at home and you're thinking, oh, that's, I need that. I've never made that choice and I want that. If you've made that decision this morning, you've, you've, you've talked to God like that, please let me know. Because that's like happy day for me. You make me happy. And I want to pray for you, and I want to continue to encourage you in this new walk of life that you're beginning. That's why we rejoice. I was once dead, and now I'm alive. Finally, Pentecost is a time to solemnly remember him. That's why we gather here each week so we can hear from the word and from the fellowship of believers that which will widen our knowledge of God and deepen our relationship with him in Christ. It's not just to remember the, what he has done, although that's important, but it's also to remember the future he's calling you to. That's why we read from Acts chapter 1 this morning in verse 8. Here's the future He is calling you to. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Remember I said God has a plan, always has. You're part of it. His plan is for you to be filled with the power of His Spirit. And be his witness everywhere you go. Jesus gave that promise to his disciples before Pentecost in Acts 2. And it was a promise for every Jesus follower. There is a powerful future ahead for you when you accept Jesus' gift of forgiveness and life. In the Old Testament for the Jews, Pentecost was about harvest. We talked about this a few weeks ago. As we understand that in our lives today, we should, like Jesus said in Matthew 9, pray to the Lord of the harvest that He would send out workers into His harvest field. All the while knowing He's going to tap us on the shoulder and say, okay, yeah, it's you. As you remember Pentecost Sunday today, would you renew your commitment to the Lord of the harvest today? Old Covenant Pentecost comes only once a year, but it's a beautiful picture of what every New Covenant Sabbath is about. Celebrating what God has done and is doing in us. 
what He's doing through us to make a difference in the lives of those around us. To bring in the harvest of people who need the forgiveness and life that can only be found in Jesus. We gather to worship, to rejoice, and to remember. To prepare us to go out in the power of God into His harvest fields to point others to true life in Jesus. And that's what our communion celebration is about. As we take time this morning to remember the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, that celebration embodies all of what we've been talking about. Gathering in solemn assembly, worshiping God, rejoicing in Him and His bountiful blessings in our lives and remembering where we've come from in order to motivate us to move forward to where He is leading us. Remembering what He has done to give us life, to excite us, about living that life to the fullest in Him. That's why we celebrate communion together. That's why we are reminded that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, He gathered His disciples together in the upper room to celebrate the Passover. And He said, oh, I've been looking forward to this. You're going to love it. And he took the regular elements of the Passover. He took the bread. And he blessed it. Gracious Father God, we thank you so much for the bread of life that you have given to us in Christ. Lord, as we hold in our hands this bread, would you allow it to remind us of our Savior? Not only of what He has done, although that is amazing, not only to remind us of what He is doing in us, also amazing. To remember where he's leading us. That the Son of God died so that I could live. Thank you, Lord, for the bread of life. Amen. Jesus blessed the bread and he broke it. And he said, take this and eat it. This is my body which is broken for you. Here we're talking new covenant stuff. This is my body which is broken for you. And as often as you do this, remember me. Remember me. Let's remember our Lord together. Scripture goes on then to say that Jesus took the cup. I don't think he had this much trouble with it.
gives you time to work on yours too. Special glue. Jesus took the cup. He gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. so we can have this relationship. My blood is given for you, for everyone, for all who will believe, for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink this, remember me. Remember me. remember him together this morning. Jesus told his disciples then, I'm not going to drink of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. There's more coming. Anticipate that. And then his word tells us that before they left, they sang. Sometimes in my mind, I hear them singing, Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus. You know, and, and that kind of a solemn, somber mood of, Ooh, how one. And that's a totally appropriate. Other times in my mind, I have to think that they were celebrating just the amazing gift that God had given to them in Christ. They didn't fully understand the whole dying on the cross and the resurrection three days. They didn't get it yet. We do. How much more should we celebrate? So won't you stand with me as we close with these songs? Oh, oh, oh. 
That is our prayer and desire this morning, that in our lives the face of Christ would be clear for all the world to see. Lord, by your Spirit, remove from us those things that block that vision of Jesus. Continue to transform our lives, getting rid of all the junk. So that people will see Christ. And so we go into this, the rest of this day and this week that you've set before us, Lord, with that objective. Would you please, Lord, continue that work in me. Continue that work in us, your church. And we will give you all the glory and the praise for it, Lord. None of it will be uh, for because of anything we've done. Lord, it's all to you. Guide us, Father. Provide every step of the way. As we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord. Glory to his name. Amen. Let's go with God.